Direct Women actually started as a presidential initiative out of the American Bar Association in 2007. The then president of the ABA challenged some group of members to think about how they could continue to use their skills and training as they move towards retirement. And so a group of women corporate lawyers thought about this question and said, well, we've been advising corporate boards our entire careers. We know it makes an excellent director and we would be excellent directors. And so thus Direct Women was formed and our annual board institute was started. In terms of the question about why now, the same as then, over the past 17 years, there have been increasing scrutiny and pressure for companies to increase the diversity on their boards. And in fact, there have been a number of studies that have shown that companies with greater gender equity on their boards are more profitable and successful. And so not only is there a, a moral obligation to have diverse voices in the corporate boardroom, but also a business case. This is Associations Thrive, the podcast celebrating successful associations and their leaders. I'm your host, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group International. Listen in as top association executives tell all, revealing the creative and innovative ways they're increasing membership, generating revenue, nurturing engagement, and reimagining their organizations. By the way, if you've launched a new initiative, created new member services, or updated your governance structure and are seeing great results, I want to hear your story and so do my listeners. I'd love to have you as a guest. Go to podcast.matrixgroup.net and apply to be on Associations Thrive. Now let's dive into this week's show. Today, I'm speaking with Sean Taylor Kaminsky, Executive Director of Direct Women. Sean, welcome to the show. Thank you, Joanna. Sean, tell us about Direct Women. Direct Women is a nonprofit organization with a mission to increase the representation of women lawyers on corporate boards. And the primary way that we fulfill our mission is through our annual board institute, where we select 16 to 20 women each year and position them for board service. We also serve as a resource for companies that are seeking diverse directors. Why is this important? Why does the organization exist? Why do we want to increase women representation on corporate boards? I'll tell you kind of our founder's story to start. Direct Women actually started as a presidential initiative out of the American Bar Association in 2007. The then president of the ABA challenged some group of members to think about how they could continue to use their skills and training as they move towards retirement. And so a group of women corporate lawyers thought about this question and said, well, we've been advising corporate boards our entire careers. We know it makes an excellent director and we would be excellent directors. And so thus Direct Women was formed and our annual board institute was started. In terms of the question about why now, the same as then. Over the past 17 years, there have been increasing scrutiny and pressure for companies to increase the diversity on their boards. And in fact, there have been a number of studies that have shown that companies with greater gender equity on their boards are more profitable and successful. And so not only is there a a moral obligation to have diverse voices in the corporate boardroom, but also a business case. So Direct Women really has been at the forefront of the board diversity space. And we really work to make sure that there is a great pipeline of women lawyers ready to serve on corporate boards. Well, I can't wait to dive into what Direct Women is doing. But before we do that, let's dive into your journey. So how do you get to become executive director of an organization like Direct Women? Sure. I've been in nonprofit management my entire career. I actually started at the American Bar Association right out of college. I was hired as a temporary worker, but I stayed there for 25 years in a variety of roles. Wow. Yeah. It was a great dumb luck situation, honestly, that I found association management right out of the gates. But my final role with the ABA was as the director of the Commission on Women in the Profession. So 
I left the ABA after 25 years in 2014 and moved to another bar association and was there for a few years when I was tapped by a volunteer leader that I had worked with at the commission who was then serving as the chair of Direct Women. And Direct Women was looking for a new executive director because they were at a transition point and were looking to professionalize their staff and their operations. So my experience with the commission and my understanding of the challenges that women lawyers experience in the practice of law, along with my nonprofit management skills, ended up being a really good fit for the organization and for me. Well, Sean, you did some very interesting things while you were at the ABA. During the prep, you talked about how when there was some kind of a transition, maybe there was a termination or loss of an important leader, you got tapped to run a division or an initiative. So tell us about that, because that's really interesting. Yes. So again, since I was at the ABA for a long time and worked with a lot of different departments, there were four different occasions where I was asked to step in when there was a transition, either the staff person left at kind of a critical moment in time, or they had to be fired. In one case, the woman who I was working for left on maternity leave and unexpectedly did not come back. So all of those created opportunities for a gap in leadership. And when I was tapped to fill those roles, one of the things I really learned was that you have to come in and demonstrate that you're in charge of the situation and show that you're confident and can lead them during this challenging time. Because there's obviously a lot of anxiety, both on the staff side of the equation and in the volunteer side. And so it really is the role of the interim leader to help take the anxiety down and engage with the leadership and the staff frequently so that you can really understand what's brewing underneath the surface might not be obvious at first Mm. and to do a bit of triage to determine what needs to be addressed and when. I also learned that doing that role, sometimes you're called upon to do a little bit of the dirty work that is hard to do when you are the permanent staff person, such as addressing underperforming staff or maybe a rogue volunteer. And I like to think that my job in that role was to steady the ship and get everybody rowing in the same direction so that there was a positive environment for the new CEO or leader to step into. And I really did find that having had those experiences was really beneficial as I moved into my role with direct women. Sean, give us an example of something that you do to quell the fear. Because there's just been a big transition. You've got people who are nervous. They have no idea what you're going to do. How do you tamp down the fear and get everybody moving in the same direction? Give us a couple tips. Well, I think that having really open communication, you have a full staff meeting right away where you get everybody in the room, you let everybody have an opportunity to share what their concerns are as a group, and then you hold individual meetings with as many of them as you can, or at least the key players that you need to have them with, because I think that you have to hear them. The old go on the listening tour strategy is a good one. You need to do the exact same thing with the executive committee or the board to make sure that you're really hearing what individuals are saying and then also hearing what they're saying to each other. There's a lot of connecting the dots between all of those different conversations that help you decide what your strategy is going to be for moving forward and making sure that you can communicate back to everybody what you're going to do and help ease their fears. Sean, that's quite extraordinary. So you were working at the ABA, but there was a division within the ABA that needed some leadership. So did you leave your position and then came back to it? Or like, how were you managing all this? It sounds like you established quite the reputation for being a leader who could step in during times of crisis. Right. Yes. As I said, the first time that it occurred was because I was already working for the same department and my boss went on maternity leave and didn't come back. So it was a fairly natural, you're second in charge, now you're tapped to be in charge of this. But the other ones, I was working for a different department and I was asked to take on these other roles in addition to my current role. Oh, wow. So now you're wearing two hats. Correct. Amazing. Yeah, it was great. Transitioning from a giant organization like the ABA to direct women, what's that like? Very different transition. Very different. I will say it was honestly pretty scary. You were leaving this really well-organized, well-supported 
organization where if you had an IT problem, you could call somebody. If you had a question about finances, you could call somebody to the point where I had to be my own IT department. I was the chief financial officer. And also because we're a nonprofit that doesn't have members and there's no membership dues, our funding is all dependent upon sponsorships and donations made by individuals who believe in our mission. And so the sole responsibility of funding the organization also fell on my shoulders. So I really did have to tell myself to be brave when I decided that I was going to take this job. I'm really glad I did, but it, it was a little nerve wracking. How do you tell yourself to be brave? What do you do? What do you tell yourself? I literally would say to myself, be brave, be brave. And also, I had a lot of cheerleaders. I had a lot of people in my life who could say to me, Sean, of course you can do this. You have the experience. You have the background. You have the ability. You can do this. So I think having a good cheerleading section, both professionally and personally, helps a lot when you need to make those decisions about being brave and stepping outside of your comfort zone. Amazing. Well, let's turn to direct women. You've got this really interesting three-pronged strategy. So tell us about that. Yeah, we are a niche organization and we really lean into that. And so everything we do has to directly relate back to fulfilling our mission to increase the representation of women lawyers. So we have three primary goals around our strategy. One is to position women lawyers for board service. The other one is to raise awareness about the importance of board diversity and the value women lawyers bring to corporate boards. And then our final goal is to build a pipeline of women lawyers who are interested in corporate board service. Sean, is it the case that the women that you interact with, are they pretty much prepared for board service or are you preparing them for board service? Ah, great distinction, Joanna. The women that we select for our annual board institute are board-ready women. These women are typically the general counsel of a public or private company, a large private company, or have a leadership role in a large law firm. And they already understand corporate governance. They know how to read a spreadsheet. They are really board ready. They know what it takes to be a great director. They've got the business acumen, the wide swath of experience in the business world. They're board ready. So we position them for board service. And by that, I mean, we help them reframe their experience as a lawyer to a business executive, because that's what they are. They're just not used to talking about themselves that way. And so we help them with their board bios and resumes and their elevator pitch so that when they are presenting themselves as a board candidate, they are talking about themselves in a way that resonates with what corporate boards are looking for. Sean, is this an application process and are they paying for this privilege? Yes, both. It's a highly selective, competitive program. We have probably 40 to 60 women each year who apply for the Board Institute, and we take 16 to 20 into our program. And we're really intentional about keeping that cohort small because we want to give them the personalized attention that they need in order to be successful. And they do pay tuition to participate. Sean, an aspect of your strategy is to create a pipeline. To create a pipeline, you have to raise awareness of direct women, and then you got to convince them to kind of step up to the plate. So what are you doing in this area? Yeah, so direct women this year as part of our strategy hired a communications consultant to help us raise awareness. There's a couple of key audiences for us that are not easily tapped into. We want to talk to CEOs of corporations, particularly public companies, and also nominating and governance chairs because they are able to change the composition of their corporate board. And we want them to understand the value that a woman lawyer can bring to their board and the benefits of adding a person with that kind of experience to their corporate board. And we needed some help in reaching that audience. And so we hired a woman who's helping us make those kinds of connections. We're writing articles and we're having interviews and people are talking on podcasts. And so all of that is coming together. We hope to increase the visibility of the organization and also raise awareness around the value that women lawyers bring to corporate boards. Well, speaking of increasing awareness, 
you're also expanding internationally. So tell us the strategy behind that. That sounds hard. It is. And I will say at this point, we are, we're dabbling in it. For the last two years, we have held a one-day program in London where we partnered with some other organizations that are interested in board diversity across the pond and had a program the first year. We had 120 people come. Our goal was 30. We thought if 30 people come to this program in London, we'll be just over the moon. Well, we had 120 people come to the first program. We had to turn people away because our space wasn't big enough. Wow. And we thought, this means we should come back. Like there is real interest here. So we did. We came back again in 2024 and we had 180 people come to the program, which was just amazing. And it was interesting to us because the women lawyers in the UK, and we had people from Europe as well who came, but it just had not occurred to them that corporate board service was something that people with a legal background should consider. So light bulbs were going off everywhere in the room and this amazing energy and vibe was really palpable. It was really exciting. And as a result, we have had a couple of women from overseas apply for the Board Institute. So our international cohort is building as well. It's very exciting. And is the goal eventually to reach out to CEOs and nominating committees of international companies so that they then are expanding their boards to include more women? Exactly. Exactly right. There are a number of initiatives within Europe and the UK to increase board diversity, that's already on their radar, but having direct women as a resource for them to increase the women on their boards is really an important goal of ours. Sean, by the time this episode drops, we'll be in September of 2024, which means we're headed into the last quarter of the year. What are you looking forward to for the last quarter? Yes. So As I said, we're not a membership organization, and so we don't have an annual meeting per se, but we do gather our community together every year for the annual Sandra Day O'Connor Board Excellence Award Luncheon. And that is just an amazing event where we honor successful women lawyer directors and a corporation that has exceptional diversity on their board in order to shine a spotlight on them and hopefully inspire others to follow in their footsteps. And this year, we are so excited because we have been invited to ring the New York Stock Exchange closing bell on October 18th. Wow. In celebration of our 200th board seat. We reached that milestone earlier this year and have been celebrating it all year long, but this is really going to be the capstone of that celebration. Well, Sean, it sounds like you're having an amazing year. You're probably set to have an amazing 2025. This has been an amazing interview. I hope you'll come back and tell us about all the amazing things that you're doing. Great. Thank you so much for having me today, Joanna. Thanks for listening to Associations Thrive. We're so glad to have you here. You know, my personal mission and the mission of my company, Matrix Group International, is to help associations and nonprofits increase membership, generate revenue, and thrive in the digital space. I want to hear stories of how your organization is thriving in today's challenging landscape. Please apply to be on my show by going to podcast.matrixgroup.net. By the way, do you need help with a digital initiative? Maybe it's a website redesign, a new membership database, or a hybrid meeting that you're planning. I'd love to connect with you. Please visit the Matrix Group website at matrixgroup.net. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Associations Thrive. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a five-star rating, post a comment, and share it with your colleagues and friends. Bye! Bye!